Exploring theories of sexual selection can help to more deeply understand the relationship between evolution and behavior. In the 1930s, the English geneticist Ronald Fisher studied the relationship between female choice and male adornment, rekindling interest in sexual selection. Fisher argued that ancestral females would have been attracted to males which had well-maintained tail feathers, since these might signal that they are likely to be good flyers. Also, since such males had time to maintain such feathers, this was evidence of superior foraging and other abilities that would aid survival. For Fisher, the feature chosen by females had to have some original survival advantage. Females who preferentially mate with males which show these inherited attractive features will produce more attractive sons since their offspring are likely to have the genes for such characteristics. Sons would also be more likely to be chosen by females in the future. To Fisher, the most important trait that a male can offer a potential mate is his genes for being attractive. This suggests that once a feature has been chosen by females, it may become progressively exaggerated with each generation, since females will constantly be looking for individuals with the largest, brightest example of that feature. Fisher called this runaway selection, since the feature runs past its original function and becomes selected purely on the basis of its attractive qualities. In this way, Fisher was able to put forward an explanation for the extreme tail feathers that we see today in peacocks. Take a look at this peacock mating dance displaying brighter plumage and courtship by the male in order to impress females. After quite a bit of time has passed in this hour-long dance and we've lost our patience, jumping ahead here we see the female has finally made her choice. Eventually, according to Fisher, such super plumage would stop being exaggerated further because of its costs to survival. By natural selection keeping runaway selection in check, that is because there will be a trade-off between attracting females and costs such as attracting predators. Despite Fisher's efforts in this area, there was still an important piece missing from the theory. Darwin assumed that males would compete with each other for female attention and that females would be the choosy ones. But why should this be the case rather than the reverse? In 1972, Robert Trivers suggested that sexual selection is directly related to asymmetries between the sexes in the effort that each parent puts into raising the offspring. He called this effort parental investment. Trivers chronicled the various ways that for the vast majority of animal species, females invest much more effort in producing offspring than do males. This asymmetry begins with gamete formation, in which males produce large amounts of low-cost sperm compared to the small number of larger, expensive eggs produced by females. Since an egg contains the material that provides for the initial development of the zygote, 
it is approximately one million times larger than the sperm that fertilizes it. In contrast, a sperm provides nothing more than its genes. A symmetrical gamete cost, however, is only the beginning of the inequality of investment between the sexes, since females apparently put more time and effort into the rearing process. For mammals, this sexual disparity in effort can be enormous due to the role of females in gestation, lactation, and general nurturing. For most species, this disparity of numbers means that while females are limited to having a comparatively small number of eggs that may be fertilized during their lives, males are limited only by the number of matings they are able to accomplish. Since females invest so much in their offspring, Trippers argued that they should be very choosy about which males they allow to fertilize their eggs. A female who makes a bad choice will have to pay a much heavier cost for her mistake because she is generally the one left holding the baby. For males, however, where the costs of reproducing are nearly always lower, Trivers predicted there should be far less discrimination in choosing us. A male that makes a poor mating choice loses very little and frequently no more than a little effort and a small amount of sperm. An extreme example of this sexual asymmetry is illustrated by the differing reproductive efforts made by male and female elephant seals. Male bull elephant seals weigh in at almost 3,000 kilograms. The female cows, in contrast, are about a quarter of the size, typically only around 650 kilograms. A bull elephant seal provides a few grams of sperm and puts his effort into inseminating as many females as possible and defending his right to do so by fighting other males. By contrast, the female cow typically produces a pup weighing around 50 kilograms. During its first five weeks of life, the pup will gain 100 kilograms and the cow will lose 200 kilograms. So, a hundred years after Darwin first proposed the mechanism of sexual selection, Trivers suggested that choosiness in females is a direct result of their greater investment in offspring. Following Trivers' paper in 1972, students of animal behavior paid more attention to the notion of female choosiness and its relationship to male traits. The repercussions of female choice are interesting when looking at characteristics in males. Is it possible that many present-day male characteristics may be the direct result of choices that their female ancestors made? Most of the work on sexual selection since Trivers paper on parental investment has been concerned with how females are able to assess a male's quality. One of the most controversial ideas came from the Israeli evolutionist Amitz Zahavi, who turned Fisher's idea on its head. Zahavi suggested that males might develop ornaments not to look attractive, but as an impediment in order to demonstrate their abilities to survive despite having such a handicap. According to this argument, males develop elaborate ornaments in order to signal, I must be a good quality male if I can survive carrying this burden. Hence, to Zahavi, male adornments allow females to assess their ability to survive and hence they are real signals of genetic quality. As with Darwin's original notion of sexual selection, despite initial criticism, what has become known as the handicap hypothesis has subsequently gained support from a number of experts. In a similar vein to Zahavi, but somewhat in contrast to Fisher's argument, in 1982, Bill Hamilton and his colleague Marlene Zook proposed that male adornments evolved to demonstrate to females that they are free from parasites. They call this the parasite theory of female choice. Parasites, of course, may be anything from tapeworms and fleas to microbial life forms such as bacteria and viruses. Parasites account for a larger proportion of fatalities than either predators or competitive conspecifics. The argument is that males which develop an elaborate healthy feature should be chosen by females since they are likely to pass on healthy genes to their offspring. So, if males with the fewest parasites are able to produce the most elaborate ornaments, and if females choose males on this basis, then they should be passing disease resistance on to their offspring. Although the Hamilton-Zook theory has been favored in recent years, it is not universally accepted 
and there is still much debate surrounding sexual selection theory. Currently, the main debating point is whether male's ornamentation has evolved simply to make them attractive to females, or whether it serves as a signal of real quality. The former argument can be traced back to Fisher, while the latter is currently supported by the Hamilton Zook parasite theory. Matt Ridley refers to this debate as the Fisherians versus good geners, although it has been called sexy sons versus healthy offspring. Currently, both sides can claim some support from the experimental literature. For the good geners, it's necessary to demonstrate that male adornments are widespread, real signals of health and disease resistance in the animal kingdom. For the Fisherians, it's necessary to demonstrate that females favor males purely for their attractive features, their sexiness, which a female can then pass on to her sons. One area of study which appears to support Fisher's runaway selection hypothesis concerns sensory bias in females. Female sensory bias means that they pay particular attention to specific male features and that such an attention bias is inherited as a part of sexual selection. Basilow demonstrated, unsurprisingly, that female swordtail fish prefer males with the longest sword, an extension of the tail fin which only males of the species have. This would be predicted by both fisherians and good geners. What's surprising was the finding that females of a closely related species called platyfish, a species in which neither sex has a sword, also prefer males with a long sword. So these females prefer males of another species because they have the same sensory bias as their close relatives. The explanation for this appears to be that male platyfish used to have a sword, which they lost quite recently in evolutionary terms. But females still have the sensory bias for this feature. Basilow suggests that the sword of a swordtail fish does not signal a real health benefit but that it is simply a sexy male feature. But surely, if female platyfish currently have a sensory bias for a sword-like tail, how can we explain its loss in the males of their own species? Haynes and Gould may have provided the answer by studying a relative of both sword tails and platyfish, guppies. They found that guppies with shorter tails were better able to escape from an artificial predator than those with longer ones despite the fact that females preferred the longer-tailed males. Perhaps the ancestors of each of these three related species had to solve different problems of predator pressure. Following an initial female preference for long tails and a common ancestor of all three species of fish, perhaps platyfish and guppies moved to areas where, due to specific predator pressure, the benefit of a shorter tail outweighed the advantages of having a sexy long tail. This scenario may be a good illustration of how natural and sexual selection may pull in different directions, and how males might have to make compromises. Today, there is quite clear evidence that female choice is involved in the development of male adornments. In swallows, it is well established that females prefer males with longer tail feathers. This finding in isolation might be taken as evidence for either a fisherian or a good genes argument. Take a few moments to think creatively now as an experimental designer. How would you design an experiment to test whether the long tail feathers of the male swallows is a result of adaptation for fisherian attractiveness or good genes healthiness? Define the independent variable and the dependent variable. As a way to be less abstract, design using the approaches in this video which is used for experimenting with hummingbirds. Hummingbirds are ravenous. These tiniest of birds have the highest metabolism of any warm-blooded animal. And they're fueled by flower nectar. To get it, they've developed skills no other birds have. They can fly backwards and hover for long stretches of time. Their beaks stay steady like a surgeon's scalpel. But their wings beat furiously, up to 80 times a second. And they can hover in wind, in rain even. 
Most of these birds weigh less than a nickel. You'd think they'd get blown away. So how do they pull it off? Scientists at UC Berkeley brought hummingbirds into the lab for a closer view. First, the wild birds had to be trained, one at a time, to feed from an artificial flower filled with sugar water. Hummingbird wings buzz like helicopter blades, too fast for the naked eye to see. But by recording them with a high-speed camera at a thousand frames a second, scientists can see the individual wing movements. They can actually see how hovering works. Most birds flap their wings up and down to fly. But hummingbirds move their wings backwards and forwards in a figure eight movement, like oars. This generates lift during the upstroke and the downstroke, which helps hummingbirds stay stable instead of bobbing up and down. But how would a hummingbird respond when the weather gets rough? To find out, the scientists moved the hummingbird into a wind tunnel and hit record. The wind is coming from the right side of the cage, up to 20 miles per hour. The hummingbird must fly into the wind to get the sugar water. This high-speed footage shows how the bird twists and turns its body in the direction of the airflow while using its wings for control and its tail like a rudder to stay steady. Even rain can't stop the hummingbird from feeding. See how it shakes off drops of water from its body like a wet dog? The birds can't afford not to eat. They have to consume their weight in nectar every day to survive. And the flowers need them too. As they eat, hummingbirds spread pollen from plant to plant. It's a symbiosis, a two-way street between a bird and a flower. These tiny flying machines have evolved ways to hold up their end of the bargain. Rain, wind, or shine. See if you can come up with a hypothesis for your design. In 1994, Norberg decided to determine whether or not male swallowtail feathers are a direct signal of a healthy feature or just a signal of sexiness. He placed a number of male swallows in a wind tunnel and discovered that those with longer tail feathers had improved flight performance due to an increase in lift. This suggests that the long tail feathers not only increase the attractiveness of a male, but that they may do so because they are a real and direct indication of good genes. They aid the development of an aerodynamically superior tail despite ecological pressures such as the presence of parasites. Thanks for joining us. See you next time.